I don't know if this is a sentiment shared by the vast majority, but it feels like this generation was the one where everybody and their grandmother thought that they could be an RPG. Stats to grind, character customization, quests and side quests, loot systems, maybe even dialogue options, the term RPG is increasingly hard to pin down. But that's also what makes a damn fine RPG, like Disco Elysium or The Witcher 3 for example. Going forward, the RPG genre needs to take note of the do's and do nots of the past. What we've loved, and more specifically, what we've hated. Over not just this generation, but past ones too. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 overused RPG mechanics that must die next generation. Number 10, uninspired, mind-numbing fetch quests. Uninspired is the operative word here because what makes something like The Witcher 3 so special is even when you're going from A to B, you care what's going to be there when you arrive. There is a huge difference between being told to go and grab or kill something and being motivated to do so. If you're motivated to take down a wolf in the woods because it used to be someone's loving husband who ran away, then there's at least the tiniest bit of intrigue. Extra points if the writing is well done too. What doesn't work is making the protagonist go and get stuff for the sake of it just to pad out the length of the game, so that you can brag about more side quests in the adverts or on the back of the box. Ultimately, we need something worthwhile every single time. Motivate the player, show them why the protagonist would want to do this quest, and in turn that will bolster the immersion of why you're playing in the first place. Number 9. Weapon Durability from a developer's standpoint, there are obvious gameplay benefits to giving equipment such as lockpicks, hacking tools, and supplements limited use. Weapons though, especially swords and guns, I mean, what's the point? Besides the fact that it's tradition or somehow extends the game. Your weapon breaks, but the enemy has the exact same one, so you pick that up and everything just continues as it was. Honestly, although Breath of the Wild isn't an RPG, its durability system got so much flack, but that game handled it with purpose. There you were burning through a variety of weapons changing up combat, and you could do double damage if you threw a near-broken weapon rather than attack with it. It wasn't perfect, but it was more than just, now this thing is broken. If you're gonna have durability, make it a gameplay mechanic. Number 8. Inconsistent Mechanics From spells to shooting, hacking to hunting, arguably the more things for the player to do, the better off your RPG is going to be. This isn't always the case though, and in recent years we've seen a rise in survival elements in gaming, RPGs especially. Survival is just one instance of a set of mechanics or systems that don't always work. Sure, if you've built the game from the get-go and communicated that this is a hardcore survival wilderness game, then by all means flesh that out. But if you just want to jam food, water, stamina, sleep, sex, and dog walking stats into your RPG because it's in vogue, then that probably isn't going to work long term. Random, unnecessary, and inconsistent mechanics pushed into games they aren't welcome in do not add depth, and it can often ruin an otherwise engaging, manageable experience. Number 7. Radiant Quests Another settlement needs your help. The Thieves Guild needs you to get the same item from the exact same building you just went to, or you need to go and kill another wanted criminal. Similar to that of the uninspired fetch quest, Radiant Quests, also known as Todd Howard and other developers' ability to say you can play this game forever, are just unnecessary. Let's break down an example. Whenever you go within a 5 mile radius of Preston Garvey in Fallout 4, he will sprint at you, passion burning in his eyes, to let you know a settlement is being attacked. That's your motivation, a settlement that you don't even remember is now in danger. You could go and help them out, clearing out any enemies and earning some pennies, but you could also just not do that. Instead, if you stay as far away from Garvey as humanly possible, there are zero consequences. This style of quest is present throughout so many often lacking RPGs, and they offer very little other than a way to fill your time or to grind out some items and weapons. The main issue is that they aren't just repetitive, they are repeated quests that offer no change, benefit, or consequence. Number 6. Tanky enemies for the sake of it Tank-like enemies, bullet sponges. You know them and you probably don't like them, but they're absolutely everywhere. If an enemy has a lot of health just cause, then there's something painfully wrong in the design of said enemy. I've mentioned motivation a couple of times already and it applies here too. Because why is this enemy such a tank? If it's because of armor or they're a hulking big brute, then fine, but a regular NPC suddenly being near unkillable because a ton of health is their only characteristic, that's just lame. Make this type of enemy unique, give them a weakness or even multiple weaknesses, thus lining up with character builds or attack methods. You know, the things that play into role-playing on the player side. 
a certain type of spell they don't like, a spot in their armor you can shoot, or a mannerism that you can exploit. Having enemies with way more health than everyone else just isn't exciting, and it only nullifies the memorability of actual boss encounters. Number 5. Cliché Dialogue and Characters this one kinda sucks because characters, dialogue, and writing in general used to be the flagship qualities of RPGs. Figuring out who characters are, what their driving forces are, their intentions, who they brush shoulders with, and who they oppose, all are fun questions to answer that can define an entire story's direction. And yet, some developers to this day completely miss the mark. Let's use Fallout 3 as an example. Gameplay hasn't aged very well and New Vegas is thankfully now commonly accepted as the better game, but Bethesda's first stab at the Fallout canon gave us characters on another level. If you ask anyone to name a few characters from Fallout 3, they could. This is because even though the story itself was a fairly simple chase, the world was crammed full of memorable NPCs. Moira Brown, Lucas Sims, and Mr. Burke, all three are found in the very first settlement you reach. It goes to show that even if your world is a smush of grey and brown, if you can place vibrancy through character, then players will be engaged and will remember your game for years to come. As a counterpoint, can anybody name anyone in Anthem? Thought not. Number 4. Unnecessary Weight Limitations and Encumbrance Weight limits and encumbrance are potentially the most arguable entry in this whole list. On the one hand, yes, they're a pain, stopping the flow of the game to make you hike back to town to store those special potions. On the other, they can be a really interesting feature when paired with realism. For example, working very well with the aforementioned survival mechanics of managing hydration, hunger, and sleep if the whole thing feels intentional and not limiting. Obviously, yes, I appreciate there's a weight limit for the sake of game design, so that you don't pick up literally everything you come across. However, if you really think about it, how much of a problem would raising or removing the weight limit be in the situations. Could it really affect the game? Even if you gave us some spells to transport items back home, I mean, what really changes? All you're doing is removing the busy work of traveling home and then wandering back to where you were to continue, so why not? If you're a dogged encumbrance defender, sound off down in the comments. Maybe there's something outside of a defense based on realism that I'm totally missing. Number 3. Boring Combat it can be difficult to keep combat exciting across a huge number of what are still bladed weapons, spears, etc. Guns and spells are a bit easier due to the variety of ammunition, firing modes, or spell effects, but so few games treat them in a way other than press to attack. Fable had a neat system of tapping to unleash one type of spell, then holding for another. And Magicka let you combine the shoulder buttons for all sorts of different elementals, but these are so few and far between. Back to melee, and shields definitely make an encounter more interesting, but if the combat is left to something as dull as attacking, blocking, and maybe parrying, it's hardly next generational. First person hack and slasher Mordhau is a beautiful example of how you can make a long list of similar melee weapons all feel unique. Stabs, thrusts, parries, slow and heavy movement, rapid attacks, low or high, throw in a dodge roll and immediately there's a ton on offer. Obviously Dark Souls comes to mind as something of an answer to this, and From Software continued to expand their formula masterfully. The only problem was that everyone else then copied their control scheme and that same approach to turtling bosses. If any developer can master combat, making something as common as base action enthralling, then they should have laid an engaging foundation for the entire genre to build on. Number 2. Factions Locking Your Choices Factions are a way for developers to neatly categorize and manage which quests you're going to do, and how they'll impact the game. Usually locking off other quests and areas once you reach a certain loyalty, factions not only limit gameplay but also player choice. Signing up with a group might just be part of the game and that's fine enough but it can impact decision making and immersion if choices are so firmly decided through the side that you choose. Not to mention, if you lay out a world where factional warfare is rife, and you're the person going between all these different leaders, that has to matter at some point too. Fallout 4 let you be best friends with so many important individuals, but that game's climax always defaults to, well, you need to pick a side, even though you know all the information that could have brought everyone together. It's a tough balance, but get it wrong and at the most important moments, it feels like all our player agency just got taken away. And number one, meaningless character stats. 
Obviously, no, you can't get rid of character stats. These are the very essence of a player's build and how they choose to tackle a game. What you can do, though, is make them mean so much more than just extra padding. Random unique stats that a developer like the name of are all well and good. I mean, poise in Dark Souls, anyone. But if they don't do anything new, then what's the point? Something like Disco Elysium embraces its wacky character stats and gives every single one of them a clear purpose, impacting your character at different times. Shivers refers to literally helping you remember something from your character's memories. Inland Empire is a weird name, but lets you open your mind, fleshing out conceptual possibilities and allowing for conversations with your own clothing or the different items around you. Not only are those two stats unique, they're also a little bit out there and they contribute to the game's overall focus on being a detective. So many times we look over character sheets, failing to memorize the 20 odd categories that define who we're playing as. Shrink that number down and make them all matter though, and you've got the next evolution of the RPG genre. At least, that's what I think. What would you lose or iterate on for the next generation of consoles? The RPG genre is almost 40 years old at this point, so it's about time things took a major leap forward. For now, I've been Scott from WhatCulture.com. Please check out the WhatCulture Gaming Podcast, and I'll catch you soon.